In this video, we're rejecting both too thin coats and smooth blending, and I promise you it's going to make your painting far more confident in the long run. And if you stick around towards the end, I'll tell you exactly how professional painters and Golden Demon winners use these exact techniques in some of their winning pieces. So let's start this week's journey. Now, when it comes to rejecting these traditional mini painting methods, I'm first and foremost drawn to the wonderful people at Craftworld Studios. This video is highly inspired by their style, so please drop them a follow on Instagram, or if you would like to know even more about the techniques they do, I'll leave a link to their Patreon below as well, where you can learn all of their tips. I have the model assembled with the shield separate. Both are sprayed black, and then the shield is attached with blue tack. This is so that we can get a consistent Zenithal spray. I've chosen to spray from the direction that he's looking. I'm now going to start laying down colours, starting with sky blue, Indian shadow and black forest green. These are all put on the model and overlap together while still wet. Anything that's going to be in maximum light, I'm going to paint sky blue. Anything that's a mid-tone is going to be Indian shadow and anything that is the shadow of the model is going to be painted black forest green. The overlapping of the colours is really rough, there's no thought or rhyme or reason behind how I'm doing it. You could equally get away with just using straight transitions if you feel more confident doing that. With the tone of the model set, we can now start on the colour we want the model to appear. We're looking towards the browns and off-whites for this, towards very orange-yellow but very desaturated. My main tone here I'm using is brown leather. I dilute the paint with a bit of water, or if you're using Citadel paints, use Lamium Medium. We want the layer below to show through slightly, so that the base tone is not lost. If we mix this as a glaze, we're going to be here for days. So, we just dilute it slightly with water so that we don't get full coverage. Whip away any excess on a towel, and come in. Don't worry about the direction of the strokes, don't worry about getting it in recesses, or even stopping midway on a panel. Any of this texture is just going to show through towards the end and add real visual interest to your model. We now continue the same process as before, but this time we're using pure walnut. Dilute the paint the same as before, we don't want that full coverage still, but this time try to avoid the recesses, try to leave some of the darker colours showing through there. I'm not really being too tidy here with the brush stroke, it starts and stops in random places, I put some stippling in there, all of this is just with very thin paint to try and build more and more textual interest while still showing the previous layer through the paint. I might have gone a bit too opaque here with this layer, so dilute it a bit more than this. I now start highlighting the model with the birch and walnut in a 50-50 mix. Same process as before, using thin paints and letting the layer before show through. Focus on the areas where the light is going to hit. For this, we need to know where our light is coming from. So we're going to simplify a bit here to make it a bit more approachable before we dive deeper on it in later videos. If you want more details of this stage here, I've left a link to an absolute masterclass by Painting Shambles in how to position lights on your models. For this, I'm having the light coming from behind me and on the right, so as I'm looking at the model, the highlights are going to be placed on the right of this model, focusing on sort of the face and the right hand side of the legs. Taking the same approach again, but this time we use pure birch, covering slightly smaller area. Try and keep it within the area we defined before, but don't worry again, if it does come out of the area, it's not the end of the world, it's just going to add some more visual interest to the model, and sort of go and mimic chips or damages in the armour, imperfections. I then do the same again with a 50-50 mix of birch and white sands. This time here I really want to focus these only towards the face and the top areas of the model, where the light is going to be strongest. Use these sparingly and keep them small. Now, with the armour done, there's one more thing we can do, and this is what a lot of Golden Demon winners do. Once you've gotten all of this interesting texture down and built up, you can do a unifying glaze across the model with really any colour you want. This is to really pull the model together. The more layers you do here, 
the smoother you can make your designs. But we're not after smoothness here, we're just trying to unify it a bit. The eyes can now be painted, and for this I'm using deep red. I'm not trying to be tidy here, overspilling it a bit is just going to look like glow. I then take pure Albaran red and pick out just the centre of the eye. I then mix in a tiny bit of white sand into it and go even smaller in the eye again. And finally, a drop of white sands in some of the corners. I didn't really like what this looked like, so I then came back in and took away one of the white dots in the corner. Now we can jump back into how the robe was painted. I got the colours down earlier in the process, just for my completeness. However, the methods used were exactly the same as the armour, thin paint and letting the previous layer show through. We start with a thin coat of dark forest green, covering pretty much everything, even the shadows. I then take pure Sherwood green and dilute this and start building up my layers again. Going over the same area a couple of times to build the opacity, just picking out the areas towards the right of the fold, towards the top of the folds, the bits which are facing light, staying out of the recesses. As with the armour, we don't have to be tidy here. Don't worry about overspilling, don't worry about going into areas you feel like you shouldn't go into. Going into them is just going to add more visual interest, especially when you're looking at cloth. Cloth doesn't really have a perfect surface, it reflects light all over the place because of what its structure looks like. So embrace it. Don't worry about going into areas you feel you shouldn't. It's just going to make it more interesting to look at down the line, I promise you. As I was painting the eyes earlier, I also painted the red, but I decided I really didn't like it. It felt too samey. So I'm going to do a slightly different process for the rest of the red. I come in with Sunset Purple as my base, and I'm not being too worried about coverage here, but I want a bit more coverage than before to try and get rid of that red I had in before. I'm also going to base coat with the Sunset Purple all of the areas which are going to be white as well. I then follow up the same process I did with the eyes, but this time I have purple in the shadows, so it feels like it's slightly different. So, that recipe again, we're starting with deep red, we then go straight into Alboran red, we then mix in a bit of white sands into it to build up the highlights. Now, because this isn't meant to be a reflective surface, I'm not adding the pure white dots to make it look like a specular highlight. There's no need here. Now we can do a very simple non-metallic metal gold, and this is my go-to recipe, I just haven't pushed it quite as high as I would usually. Using the same principles we have throughout this video, of keeping the paint thin and letting the previous layer show through, I start with pure brown leather and build up my highlights. This tends to be full coverage for the first layer, but as I progressively mix in more and more Sahara yellow, I cover less and less area. Usually the mix has ended up being a 70-30 and then a 30-70 before I'm at the pure Sahara yellow. Keep the highlights in line with the ones you've placed on the bone armour so it holds its consistency throughout your model. With non-metallic metal, try and make sure any edge that faces towards the light is really really bright so you might have to come in with the side of a brush and do some tiny edge highlighting here. If you want to push the highlights a little more, you can start to mix in white sands into the Sahara yellow to push yourself on there. Try and use these highlights sparingly. They're specular highlights, they should be small. Now it's time for sword, and I'm using another one of my favourite recipes, my go-to for power weapons. It's dirt simple. We're keeping the same paint consistency throughout, keeping it thin and not doing the full coverage. We choose the pattern we want the light to reflect in. It doesn't really matter here, swords are a bit funky. Have a look around, find a reference pattern you like. I then cover all the sword with anthracite grey, making sure to leave the previous layers showing through again. I know, you're tired of me saying it, but that's what we're trying to learn here. We then start mixing in white sands in a greater ratios. I tend to go through ratios 80-20, 60-40, 30-70, and 10-90, before finally ending 
on pure white sands. Now, during this process, I also want to add a bit of power coming out of it. So I take Sherwood Green, dilute it down loads, and just put a drop or two around each of the nubbins on the sword, just to give it a subtle glow. The sword I want to give a bit more attention to, so I then go across and take the very top just with pure white. Finally, we need to paint the white areas. I want these to appear different with the beige of the bone, so I decided to go over the purple base and layer down straight rainy grey, still diluted a bit, still using the same principles. Build up a couple of layers of this and then start to mix in more and more white sand. I only did one layer before ending up at pure white sand. Small details and small areas of a model like this we don't really need to pay much attention to. People are only going to take a cursory look at it, they're going to be far more interested in the armour you've done. I wanted to add a bit of visual interest to his shield he's got on him, so I did a line down the centre in pure alba and red. The shield I painted the same way as the rest of the mini. I didn't really do anything fancy or different here, so I'd recommend putting into practice some of the things you learned here and just see what you want to add to the shield. Maybe you want to add a different colour, maybe you want to try something new. The only thing I will add here is the shield when I painted it looked a bit flat and everything blended together a bit too much. This is because when I was highlighting it up, I made a few mistakes here and there about how I was covering and I wasn't too careful. But don't worry, this can be fixed. I came in with just a little bit of black lining just to pick out some of the darkest shadows to add a bit more contrast between the lights and the darks and really make the center items pop. Freehanding is scary, but you're never going to get better if you don't try it, so try writing a word there. I'd recommend picking one that's an odd number of letters, that way you can start from a middle letter and work out left and right. Pick a short one to start with, do a three letter one like Axe. For the base I start building up balls of milliput, squish flat and pressed on top of each other, focusing them towards one side of the base. We do a similar underpainting, we use dark forest green and then pick out some of the areas which will be facing towards the light with sky blue. Once it's dry, we do a partial coverage again with straight rainy grey. We do a couple of layers of this, building up the opacity each time, focusing in the direction where the light is going to be coming from. We then mix in white sands into the rainy grey in about a 50-50 mix and pick out just the edges of the rocks towards the edge of the base. This way it doesn't become too overpowering. I start with Indian Shadow and just overbrush all over the base to try and get some coverage. Once that coat is dry I do the same process again but this time with Walnut, overbrushing and keeping the paint nice and thin. Finally I do the same with Birch and we just overbrush it again but this time here focusing really on just the tips and tops of the mounds of dirt in there. I don't want to draw too much attention to this skull, and I want it to appear sort of bleached. So I take white sand straight, mix it with a bit of water and do a couple of layers to build opacity and build the volumes on my skull. We now want to make this a deserty dusty look so we take Lycorca pigment and just cover the base in it, trying to avoid the rocks. I want there to be a bit more interest on the base as a flat base without any tufts just doesn't feel complete to me. I take some corpse grafts tufts and some swamp tufts, this one from the army painter, and cut some of the smaller ones in half. I don't want them to be too big. I then sort of pick out some of the deeper areas of the shadows in the rocks. Finally, we need to finish the base off with a good rimming of our favourite black before we put a dob of super glue and press our mini into position. I then add one final tuft to hide a very big gap, and the model is done. Thank you for watching and I hope you learned something today. Maybe you take some of these techniques forwards and apply them to your own painting. I'd love to see what you create with it. Don't forget to like, subscribe and comment and I'll see you all next month.